We have come now to session 10 in our Battling Unbelief series, treating unbelief as the root cause of all kinds of sins, in particular, in this case, bitterness. We're going to focus on battling the unbelief behind bitterness, but we're thinking of belief, therefore, as the key cause of love and holiness, and the ability to kill all these particular sins that we're focusing on, namely, this time, bitterness. What is bitterness? I'm defining it like this. An unforgiving, resentful, antagonistic spirit towards someone for being wronged. So someone has wronged us, and for being wronged, we are holding a grudge. We're unforgiving, resentful, antagonistic, even hostile, and that's our spirit toward them, and that goes deep and becomes often bitterness. And it's a sin. It's a deep sin, and we'll see how the Bible gives us strategies for conquering it in our life, even if sometimes we've been deeply wounded and abused. Father, I pray for the miracle that will be needed now in some people's lives so that the deep wounds of the past that they carry and will carry until Jesus comes because of abuse and hurt and mistreatment in the past would be, would be overcome and they would be made forgiving and not resentful, but kind and gentle and loving. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, of course, almost everyone thinks of this. How do you become a a forgiving person? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And then he points us backward as God in Christ forgave you. And certainly that is absolutely crucial. So in no way do I want this series of focusing on trusting God's promises of what he will do to mute the glorious truth that we must remember the cross and how we have been so freely forgiven, though we have done things worse towards God than anybody will ever do toward us. So yes, yes, yes. And of course, we are to love our enemies. You have heard that it was said, you shall love, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. No, no, no. I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Like Paul does here in Romans 10, 1. Brothers, my heart's desire, I'm not faking this. And prayer to God is that for them, his kinsmen, is that they may be saved. So these are the people that are making life very hard for him and accusing him of all kinds of bad motives and throwing him in prison and beating him. And he's praying that they may be saved in accord with Jesus' command. Pray, pray for those who persecute you here in Matthew 5. So clearly, one of the great obstacles to um, our forgiving people is our failure to come to terms with the fact that God in Christ has forgiven us. Now, that's not what this session is about. There is another obstacle to being a forgiving person, and that is the obstacle of fearing that justice will not be done. You know what I mean? So somebody has wronged you, They've done something very, very evil to you, and they need to be forgiven if you're going to have any relationship with them at all. They've hurt you so badly, but it looks like they're getting away with it. And so you have to keep bringing it up, and you have to strategize for how to make life miserable for them and how to talk bad about them and make sure everybody knows the wrong they've done because it looks like they're getting away with it. So our our sense of justice demands that something be done. Now, so what I'm adding to this backward glance of remember how God in Christ has forgiven you, I'm adding the fact that in the future, God's going to settle accounts and you don't need to. Let's look at that. 
And that's a promise that we need to believe. 2 Thessalonians 1. God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Do you see that? God considers it right and just and good and holy that on the last day, if people do not repent and be united with Christ so that their sins are paid for on the cross, but rather resist and remain in unbelief, God will repay them with affliction as they have misused you. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. This is when it's going to happen at the second coming with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance. This is how he repays. There's vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel because they've sinned often against you. They've afflicted you. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to keep seething with a sense of injustice? No, you must believe this. This is God's plan to settle your accounts. Let's look at two places where that actually is argued. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. So no private vendettas. It's not wrong that there's a government according to Romans 13, who judges in this world. But we personally don't avenge ourselves. And if we feel like somebody's getting away with something, here's what we do. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. Leave it to the wrath of God. Give place to it. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay. That is a promise. And I'm saying, in order to be free from bitterness, you need to believe that promise. Otherwise, I don't think he would have said this. We all know that the sense of justice that we feel at being wronged, that cries out for justice, if we believe this promise and leave it to the wrath of God, then you are freed from bitterness in this world. You can actually treat your enemy better than he deserves. 1 Peter 2. 21, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. So he suffered for us. So he dies in our place. That's one function of the cross. He bears our sins. And he leaves, leads an example to show how we are to suffer wrong. And here's, he, here's how he did it. Here's how he did it. He committed no sin Neither was deceit found in his mouth. So he never gave anybody a cause to treat him badly, and they treated him worse than anybody's ever been treated. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return, modeling, living, giving us an example. When he suffered, he did not threaten, giving us an example. What did he do? Giving us an example, he continued entrusting to him who judges justly. He handed himself over. He handed his cause over to him who says, I will repay. And so Jesus was able to pray for his enemies that they would repent and believe. And many of them did. They were saved on the day of Pentecost. So I'm arguing that battling unbelief, the unbelief we have to battle is not only unbelief in the cross where Christ died for our sins to make us those who are willing to forgive others, but we also need to kill the bitterness by believing God's promises, namely that God will vindicate his people in the last day and see that every wrong is justly punished. So you do not need to go on holding a grudge. You do not need to insist that justice be done in this world. It does not have to be done in this world. In fact, I would say justice is rare done in this world as it ought to be done. But God will see that every wrong is rightly dealt with. That is, we will kill the bitterness of our own hearts by being satisfied with all that God promises to be for us through Jesus, including 
being the judge of all the earth. This is the great battle. Can we be satisfied in God, God as a judge who never sweeps anything under the rug? Every wrong will be set right either by being covered by the blood of Jesus or being punished in hell. We don't need to be God. That's a great freedom. Oh, may we live in it.